Greetings, and welcome to the UR Energy webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Jeff Klenda. Thank you, Mr. Klenda. You may begin. Great. Thanks, Keith. And I'd like to take a moment to just uh, uh, thank Shelley Kraft and, uh, and the good people over at SNN Network. Uh, uh, always a pleasure to uh, be interviewed by them and have the opportunity to present our company. So thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jeff Klenda. I'm the company's chairman and CEO. And uh, what you should be looking at is uh, the uh, beautiful interior uh, of our state-of-the-art ISR facility in Wyoming. We uh, are, are very pleased uh, with uh, that particular project. Uh, it has been just uh, uh, has exceeded all of our expectations. And to the right on the side, on the right side of the slide, those barrels that you see are our finished product. When they go out of there, uh, they go out at about um, uh, 800 pounds, 850 pounds, and uh, at 50 dollars, uh, which uh, where we've been delivering into most of our contracts right at about $43,000, $44,000 per barrel, so that is the business model. Moving on here to our disclaimer, this is standard. Uh, uh, I will be making some forward-looking statements, and as I do, I will try to identify them as such all along. Just keep everybody happy. Uh, now, here, here you are is our company, with our company at a glance on uh, what should be slide number three that you're looking at now. And really the first bolded sentence I think says it all. We are very, very pleased that uh, we uh, now as we enter the month of August, this is our seventh uh, year this month. We'll mark seven years of consistent production there. We're one of only two um, uranium producers left in the United States. That's not good, but there are a number of things happening politically right now, which we will cover uh, that I think give you a great example of uh, uh, what the things that we're doing, and, and, uh, and we believe that that marketplace is about to turn around for us. But we've produced nearly 3 million pounds out of Lost Creek right now. Because of the lower prices, we are con uh, constraining our production at lower, um, at lower levels of production uh, that would be we consider to be consistent with um, market demand and, and market pricing out there. But one of the things that, that we've done and we've done over the years, which has served us quite well, is that we put uh, contracts in place starting in 2010 and 11. And by the time we were in, in production in 2013, we were delivering into those contracts. We have delivered into contracts for the last seven years, and uh, it has really been uh, something that's great for us. It's allowed us to have consistency of cash flow. Um, we've been able to uh, avoid going into the market and having to raise a lot of money uh, and dilute our shareholders, and it has really de-risked the company. Um, many of you know that in 2018, in January of that year, we actually brought a Section 232 trade action um, with the Department of Commerce uh, uh, against the, the Russians, the Kazakhs, and the Uzbeks who have been dumping material into our country through the, over the last several years. We did not prevail on the Section 232, but that gave birth to the Nuclear Fuel Working Group, which actually that was, uh, report was provided to the White House, and their report was uh, finalized and made public on April 23rd of this year. I'll go into some more detail on that, but it really has been um, something that has uh, I think, uh, given the future of uh, the, the industry, a bright future, it calls for $150 million a year annually to preserve the front end of the fuel cycle, and that's uranium mining and um, conversion. Uh, here, just a couple of slides I'd like to devote to uh, supply and demand. Here on, on the demand side, many people are not uh, aware of this, but actually nuclear provides 20% of our base load electricity in this country and more than 55% of carbon-free emissions. It is truly a growth industry. We're growing at over 3% a year. Last year, there were nine reactors that came on, one reactor that fell off, so we had eight net reactors coming onto the market. There's more than 450 under construction right now. The thing that's interesting about what's going on is that there's a real uh, supply-demand deficit that is growing. Last year's demand was roughly 187 million pounds, and the world's largest or, or second largest producer, Cameco, was actually in the market as a buyer last year. So this is all bodes very, very well for our industry. Because simultaneously, what's been taking place is we have seen a tremendous amount of global supply destruction. 
Cameco, who is the second largest producer in the world, producing out of both MacArthur River and Cigar Lake in Canada, has closed both of those facilities. Now, they just came out last week, and they announced that they may be reopening Cigar Lake uh, sometime in September. And, uh, and of course, they had they gave themselves a lot of wiggle room there. Uh, that's all very coronavirus, COVID-19 contingent. It just depends on whether or not they've uh, been able to um, flatten the curve, if you will, uh, to enable them to get back into production. But we lost a lot of primary production in 2019, uh, and, uh, and global production was only 139 million pounds. Again, remember, we we consumed 187 million pounds last year, but global primary production was only 139 million pounds. So far in 2020, we have seen an additional 46 million pounds come out of the market, and the bulk of that has been from uh, Canada and from Kazakhstan. Now, the Kazakhs are the largest producer in the world, producing about 40% of global primary production. But right now, they remain shut down. They've announced they're gonna try and come back into production in August. Again, that's, that remains to be seen. But as it stands right now, approximately 35% of global primary production, global output, has come offline. So of that 139,000 million pounds, rather, that were produced last year, we've seen about 35% of that come offline. Now, we may see some of it come back on. We don't know. But as of right now, since there are only two producers producing left in the United States and Cameco in Canada, then it puts us in a position where effectively for the first time since the nuclear age began, there is no North American production that's coming into the marketplace. And this next slide that you see, this very colorful bar graph here, is a really a very good depiction of just how big a problem this has become for the United States. Remember, we supply 20% of our electricity here in the United States, and we're 55% of carbon-free emissions. But yet, we are right now in a position where we have to import roughly 50 million pounds a year. But as you can see, in 2019, we only produced 174,000 pounds. It was the lowest level in our history. And we'll produce far less than that. You can see in the, the colorful bar chart on the very right-hand side, in the first quarter of this year, we only produced a little over 8,000 pounds. This is absolutely pathetic. We have put ourselves in a position where we are dependent on Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan, and by the way, increasingly the Chinese as well, for our nuclear fuel. This is, not only is this very uh, dangerous energy policy, but it's, but it's absolutely absurd when you think of it in terms of national security. Why we would allow ourselves to become dependent on uh, Vladimir Putin for our nuclear fuel is beyond me. How our government allows our utilities to do it, we simply don't know. We can't let nuclear go the way of rare earths. The fact is, is we get, of all the rare earths that we use, we get approximately 80% of those from the Chinese right now. So it's very important that things like the, the initiatives that we have going politically right now are successful. As you can see from this next slide, a convergence of market forces. What you see here is that the working group uh, that came out of, once again, the, the Nuclear Fuel Working Group, and they, when they put out their report on April 23rd, uh, it, was, uh, re it was reported that the intention is to establish a 10-year, $150 million uh, fund through the Department of Energy as a budget item that would support the front end of the fuel cycle. But in addition to that, and maybe more importantly, we have the Russian Suspension Agreement. And the Russian Suspension Agreement is due to expire on the last day of this year. Now, this is something that gets very complex. I'll go into it more in just a couple of minutes when I treat it separately. But this is even more important, I think, than the working group legislation because this will last for the next 20 years. So whatever the decision is by the Department of Commerce, we're going to have to live with it for a long time. But then, of course, in addition to that, we've had the pandemic. This has been something that has just changed our industry, and it's changed everything in the world. I mean, uh, it amazes me because we never shut down the world, even during uh, the two world wars. But we've effectively, in many cases, shut down the world over the coronavirus, uh, and uh, so we've seen this directly impact our industry with a direct, with a significant reduction in the amount of material uh, that's being produced. 
First, let's talk about the Nuclear Field Working Group. Now, when this came out, and it was a result of the, of the Working Group report, it called for 17 to 19 million additional pounds coming into the market, and this is from domestic producers. So there would only be a few of us that this would apply to. It's, a, it's right now budgeted at $150 million a year, and it would also call for the restart of our conversion facility. Remember, we only have one conversion facility in this country, and that's Converdine in Metropolis, Illinois, and they've been shut down since the fourth quarter of 2017. In addition to that, we have to restart domestic enrichment, and we've had some very good news on that front. We understand that uh, the facility in Portsmouth, Ohio, that we have been transferring centrifuges there, uh, and so we actually could have domestic enrichment uh, capability once again by 2023, but you can see we've put ourselves in a position where the nuclear fuel cycle is virtually dead here in the United States. And But the working group report, not only is it seeking to create a level playing field because we're competing against state-owned enterprises that not only supplement these companies that are producing uranium and, and nuclear fuel of all forms, but in addition to that, they've devalued their currencies by 85 and 90 percent in some cases. So they're producing in tenge and rubles, and this is what allows them to be so competitive and to produce so cheaply because they produce in tenge and rubles, and then they turn around and they sell in greatly appreciated dollars. Well, it's easy to look like an economic marvel when you've got those types of things working for you. But as I mentioned, the Russian suspension agreement may even be more important. The simple fact of the, of the matter is that the Russian suspension agreement has been in place for 28 years, and it allows the domestic utilities to provide up to 20% of their domestic consumption by importing Russian nuclear fuel, Russian material. Uh, the RSA, in effect, is a license to dump. And so the, the Russians have been taking full advantage of it. They've been delivering this material into the United States, and they've been making a great deal of money at it. But in addition to that, the, the Russians also own about half of the limited partnerships that are in Kazakhstan that are the largest producers in the world. And so they not only are, are, are they um, selling this material into our country under the suspension agreement, but they're also dumping the Kazakh material into our country that's completely unrestricted. Now, the Russian suspension agreement expires this year on December 31st. We're in the middle of what's called an administrative review right now that's just been extended. So we basically need to amend and extend the existing Russian suspension agreement by October 5th, or a full-scale investigation is launched, and what is supposed to happen is that the uh, tariffs on Russian material would go back into effect that were affecting in 1992. So those are, are uh, effectively tariffs at 120%. So this is a real battle that's taking place right now. We have we have standing in this. We, uh, we are interested parties, and so we are directly engaged in these negotiations. But let me talk for a moment about our uh, projects and, and where we fit into all of this. We are, our flagship property is our Lost Creek project, and as you can see from the top line on this slide, we've been in production for 72 years, but what's really amazing is that we have been producing and are still producing pounds out of our first mine unit seven years after it initially started. If you get two to two and a half, three years out of a mine unit, that's amazing. But for us to still be flowing and producing our first mine unit after seven years is astonishing. And look at that recovery, 92% recovery. Nobody in the industry is getting that that we know of. And you can see that since we began, uh, since, since March of 2011, uh, on the bar chart that you see down below, we only had about six and a quarter million pounds. Today, we're over 20 million pounds, so we've produced nearly three million pounds. This is a very scalable project. We will be producing out of this project for many years to come, so it has been an absolute beast. And when you take a look at this in, and also add that to our Shirley Basin project and our Lost Soldier project, you can see that across all um, uh, forms of, uh, of mineral resources and their classifications, whether it's measured, indicated, or inferred, uh, we have a, a very, very strong uh, amount of uh, material, over 40 million pounds. So we're ready to bring Shirley Basin on, and we think that we are in excellent position here to be able to ramp up our production. And so if you take a look at the, uh, well, 
before we go, before we look at that, let me let me first spend a moment on this slide on uh, what we've accomplished at, at uh, Lost Creek. You can see this is broken down year by year. And last year we had a great year. We delivered 665,000 pounds into contracts that produced for us over $12 million in gross profits. Uh, 2020, we've already made our deliveries, but as you can see from the lines above under, let's take a look at, for example, the, the captured pounds. In 2015, we produced over three quarters of a million pounds, and we had revenues of 41 million. But you can see we got our C1 cash costs all the way down to $16 a pound. And now we've been drifting in the 20 cents, and that's because we greatly lowered the number of pounds that we're producing while we're waiting for new contracts. So um, th this is something we're, we're ready to ramp back up. We've done a great job of keeping our operational staff on hand. We have 20 people at the plant, and this should be able to provide us with the ability to, to ramp up quickly. And here's what the ramp up would look like. The blue is Lost Creek. The orange is the Shirley Basin, followed by, in the gray there, Lost Soldier. And so we expect that we would be able to go from effectively care and maintenance where we are right now to ramp up to a million pounds or a bit above a million pounds and to be able to do that and be at that run rate in about a six-month period of time. And certainly within a year, we'd be able to sustain that and, and, and be at a run rate for a million pounds a year, um, and so in well less than a year. Shirley Basin Basin is ready to come on. We think that that would be closer to about 14, 15 months, but uh, we know that we can ramp up very quickly. And as I mentioned, we have we have retained our operating staff. This is so important because this is highly specialized what we do, and keeping good technical people on board is something that's absolutely critical to our future success. So we're very pleased with the position that we're in. We uh, have provided ourselves with excellent runway through to next year, and we've kept on our critical people. So if we get those contracts, when we get those contracts, we'll be able to ramp up very quickly. And the thing that I think we're, probably separates us from any of our peers is that we believe we can ramp up faster and at lower cost than anyone else in our industry. At Lost Creek alone, it's going to cost about $15 million to be able to ramp up to a million pound per year run rate. Again, we think we can do it in six to nine months, and then with revenues being able to cover any future development. Shirley Basin would follow closely thereafter. We'd be able to ramp up to at least a half a million pounds a year run rate there and get there in about 15 to 18 months. That's a little more. It's about 26, 27 million, but we have to build out a satellite plant there, which will ship loaded resins over to our Lost Creek facility. But once again, if you combine them, it's only about 40 million. In mining terms, that is nominal, but that could get us to a million and a half, two million pounds per year, and we could do that in under two years. So uh, we should be, I don't know of any anybody else in our industry that can do that as quickly as we can. One of the things that also separates us from our peers, and this is really our four primary peers in the United States, and we do think it's all about the dilution. Remember that Fukushima, the tsunami that destroyed the, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi plants, uh, back in 2011 has really caused the industry a lot of pain and suffering because it's been, we've been consistently oversupplied and, and with lower demand because of all of the reactors that were shut down in Japan. But you can see here that our dilution has been minuscule compared to our peers in our industry. Some of them are just off the charts. But the fact is, is that they have had to consistently dilute their shareholders We've been very fortunate since Fukushima occurred nearly uh, nine and a half years ago now. We have only raised about $27 million in the marketplace. We've been able to survive based on our solid contracts that we had in place, and we just delivered into the last of those contracts uh, in April. So we're finished with our deliveries for the year, but it puts us in a position where uh, we have not had to dilute our shareholders. And again, as I mentioned, we've got good runway into next year. Now, what you see here is our current share capital and, and uh, cash position. Uh, I'll forewarn you right now. We did a registered direct last week. It was cl it, uh, uh, we finished it and finalized the investors in it on Friday. We will close it tomorrow, but it will bring in additional cash. Um, we did a press release 
We raised under $5 million. We're very stingy with our stock. We, uh, we try not to issue if we don't have to. But uh, it puts us in good position where we should have runway now that takes us out into third quarter, through third quarter of 2021. So we're in very strong position uh, in terms of cash. And we also have inventory. If you look at that second box on the left-hand side, we have about 270,000 pounds in inventory and probably another 10 that we can make available there. So we think that we're going to have upwards of 280,000 uh, pounds that we can sell uh, in the, into the marketplace. And we feel that with the number of pounds that have been shut down uh, in our industry, we think that we will see rising prices in the second half of the year. And so our inventory should be rising in value as that occurs. Analyst coverage, you can see there, you can see those are the names, that, and those are pretty much uh, the best analysts in the industry for covering the uranium space, and every one of them cover us. Uh, on the following slide here, these are the catalysts that we think need to be mentioned. Everyone wants to know, well, what's the play? Where are you guys going from here? What are the things that can impact you and impact you quickly? Well, I've broken it down into three categories, and I think that it's important if you're taking a look at why someone would want to buy our shares? Well, this is why. We think that the supply-demand fundamentals are going to be reasserting themselves, and this is something that's happening right now as we speak. In fact, the World Nuclear Association, in their biennial report, they basically reported uh, that, that the growth in nuclear and the demand for uranium, for uranium was rising in all of their scenarios, their lowercase, their base case, and their uppercase scenarios. In addition to that, we're going to see by the middle of this decade that small modular reactors and micro reactors will be, uh, are going to be being built out at a very rapid pace. This is going to substantially increase demand. And already this year, we have seen supply destruction of 35% of global uh, primary production. Now, this is something, once again, Will we see some of that ramp back up? Yes, but I don't believe that it's going to be enough that it can offset the structural deficit that we are expecting. If you take a look at the current market forces, now we've touched on these. COVID-19 has caused spot price to move almost 30%. In fact, uh, we are one of the top, uh, well, up until last month, we were the top performing uh, uh, commodity in the marketplace. Um, I don't, gold and silver may be rivaling us at this point, but uh, we were outproducing everybody. So already the supply-demand squeeze is pushing prices higher. We've seen Cameco in the market as a buyer, and actually over the last two weeks, we've seen the largest producer in the world, Kaz Prom, that is also a buyer. So they've been in the market buying as well. If we can get through the budgeting process, and, and this is really a political morass that I wouldn't wish on anybody, but the fact is is that we have to go through appropriations and make it through the final budget to see the $150 million in there for a 10-year period of time, and that would be through the Department of Energy. But if you've been listening to Dan Briette, the current Secretary of Energy, he is a big advocate of ours. He constantly talks about how he needs to rebuild the front end of the fuel cycle, and he is even hinted at taking it out of the Department of Energy budget if it doesn't make it through the budget process this year. And then finally, of course, the expiration of the Russian suspension agreement. This is the real wild card. I have a call on this later today. We, this is very important to us. We're very well engaged in this. We don't know what's going to happen yet. October 5th is a big date, but it's either going to be amended and extended, or there's going to be a full-blown investigation and tariffs will be levied against the Russian material. And finally, the geopolitical risk. Look, you just can't, you just can't overlook this. Uh, the fact is, is that we face conflicts around the globe, and none hotter right now than, than in the Sea of Japan and the Bering Straits up there. We've had encounters with Russian aircraft. Syria is heating up once again. And, of course, we have the ongoing debate over the Nord Stream pipeline uh, that is coming uh, from Russia that will go directly into Western Europe. Uh, and this is, uh, so these are all sources of conflict, and, uh, of course, we continue to find ourselves in a position where we see this dumping by our geostrategic rivals, Russia and Kazakhstan. And the simple fact of the matter is, is that somebody's got to bring some some sense back into this thing. This is really this cannot go on. We cannot allow our country, who has been the leader in all things nuclear, and we have been the primary deterrent 
to nuclear proliferation. We cannot cede that front-running position to the Russians and the Chinese. Some would say we already have, but it's not too late. We've got to rebuild the fuel cycle, and we've got to regain that preeminent position. Finally, when you take a look at the takeaways from my presentation today, what I'd like to emphasize is that we do have that solid runway. Uh, we had great revenues last year, great profits. Um, cash resources, again, that is a dated figure, and it does not include the nearly $5 million that we raised at the end of next week and will close tomorrow. We did restructure. We have an industrial revenue bond with the state of Wyoming, and we were able to work out a deal with them whereby we had six uh, quarters where we're only servicing the interest. We're not servicing the principal. And until we get contracts, I'm confident that we'll be able to continue to get the cooperation of the state of Wyoming and that they'll be able to uh, work with us and make sure that this isn't a burden for us that prevents us from uh, staying in business. And, and we we feel very confident that, uh, that they'll continue to work with us. The attorney general that put the industrial revenue bond in place with us is now the governor of the state. We have a great relationship. We also were able to secure in April some of the PPP loans out of the SBA. That was for nearly $900,000, and we have utilized them thoroughly uh, at our uh, Lost Creek facility, and we think we have put ourselves in a position where we can uh, secure full forgiveness of those loans. So uh, it'll be treated as income when that happens, but still, uh, that was a godsend. We're very grateful for it, and, and we believe that we were exactly the type of company that it was intended to help when we received those. But if you take a look, as I mentioned, here's where I really would like to close out strong and emphasize that we've got, we've kept our core operational staff on. We've got that operational leverage. We believe that we are in better position to ramp up more quickly at lower cost, and what that means is at lower dilution than any of our peers. And we always maintain numerous funding strategies, so we're really not in a position where we need to worry about that. Uh, here, I'll close out. Here's my, my information. Um, so here you have uh, not only my email address, but my, um, my, my cell phone. I love to talk shop and happy to take calls at any time. And with that, uh, I will uh, take any questions that we may have. I think I still have a minute or so, and uh, if there are any questions, I'll pick them up. It looks like we have a quiet group today. I'm not seeing that there's anything on deck, and so uh, we're at 29 minutes after the hour and just about to turn over to 30, so I guess I did a pretty good uh, job of uh, utilizing my full 30 minutes. So with that, I will say thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you have a wonderful week. Stay safe, and uh, uh, I, if you have any questions, please feel free to call me. Thank you very much. This concludes today's webcast. You may now disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.